In multiple states across the country, right-wingers, not entirely, but almost entirely right-wingers, are now protesting against quarantine measures that have been put into effect by mayors, governors, and all of that. They're not happy about it, and we are finding out more about these protests as time goes on. For instance, um, one, so this is uh, one of the Michigan groups, uh, the Michigan Freedom Fund, Fund, according to Progress Michigan, is apparently a Betsy DeVos-backed corporate front group. So Betsy DeVos, of course, in the Trump administration, um, has been providing funding to these. And what you find basically, I'm not going to run through the entire thing, but a lot of the organizations, the very wealthy organizations that are funding these groups, regardless of what state they're in, are the same sorts of organizations that were funding the Tea Party back not that many years ago. And so, and probably I'm going to assume not for the same obvious reasons, but the same implicit reasons. Uh, to create chaos, uh, to benefit the economy from their perspective. And again, if people have to die, Anna Kasparian, eh, it's mm -hmm. not going to be them. Betsy DeVos isn't going to be exposed to coronavirus. It's, it's really incredible to see what's happening. And I think that there are two things that we need to consider when trying to understand what's at play. So on one hand, there's an issue with misinformation campaigns. Um, I know from personal experience, people in my personal life have asked me all sorts of questions about conspiracy theories that they've read on social media. And so you unfortunately have to not only debunk those conspiracy theories, but urge people to take these social distancing measures seriously. Um, there are bad actors at play, of course, uh, both when it comes to misinformation and when it comes to funding these types of protests. But I think that it would be a mistake to avoid addressing a very real concern that people have. Look, we forget that Congress has really failed in offering a real financial solution for people who have been laid off. So some of these people are clowns and they don't know what they're doing and they're just listening to what Fox News tells them to do. On the other hand, though, I think there are people who aren't able to pay their bills. They've been unable to file for unemployment because the unemployment system in every state is overwhelmed and overburdened. They're not even able to get through and apply. And then the $1,200 stimulus check is honestly nothing when you consider how much people need to pay in their debts, in their bills. Uh, to provide for their families, to put food on the table. So I think there are so many different factors at play, mm -hmm. but we need to be hyper-focused on the failures of Congress because if people felt comfortable staying home and not working, if they knew that they were taken care of, I think that there, this would be less of an issue. But when people yeah. are feeling that economic frustration, um, coupled with the misinformation they might be seeing in conservative media, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, yeah, I agree. And uh, a little bit later on, we're going to be talking about Steve Mnuchin, how much $1,200 can actually buy you and uh, give some suggestions for what the next step should be when it looks like there aren't going to be any next steps that Congress is pretty much done. Um, as far as I've seen, though, most of these groups so far, uh, I don't see them rallying for Congress to, for instance, make the, you know, the version of UBI that we have right now persistent, you know, for the next year or whatever, or to extend sick leave to all, you know, all Americans or institute single payer so that people's health care won't be tied with their continued employment. These sorts of policy based uh uh, solutions for the problems that we face that we might suggest, they seem a little bit less interested in that and a little bit more interested in sticking it to Democratic governors and proving that they're tough. Um, one of the reasons that they're probably holding guns, which we're going to get to. Um, but I want to read a couple of quotes from some of those involved because I've been sort of speaking for them. Let me let them speak for themselves. Um, so let's start with Ashley Smith co-founder of Reopen NC for North Carolina. Uh, that is a group that she started um, after seeing an online rumor that the lockdown order was going to be extended until June. It wasn't true. And in fact, North Carolina's lockdown order is going to end in three days unless it's extended. But the group remains, even though it's based on nonsense. And so here's what she had to say. When it's my time to go, God's going to call me home. I think that to live is inherently to take risks. I'm not concerned about this virus any more than I am about the flu. So a uh, couple months of uh, in uh, increased education about, you know, what coronavirus represents, how it is different from the flu, has been successful in educating some Americans, uh, but not others. And, and I would remind people again that it is one thing to say, I am willing to take a risk with my life. But this is not like, you know, this isn't cliff diving. 
like cliff diving doesn't catch, okay? You can't spread it to other people. This virus, you very much can. And you might be fine if you get exposed to it, but you could very easily expose other people who are not going to make it. I have to be honest. Um, I'm actually uneasy and afraid right now. Um, so I just want to be, I know I'm putting myself in a super vulnerable position by even admitting that, but we're in a dire situation where the entire country is not on the same page. People don't agree on what we need to do to combat this virus. A lot of people have already died and that's with the social distancing in place. If these red states continue to loosen restrictions, if you know, right wingers um, talking about private citizens refuse to even follow the social distancing guidelines, more and more people are going to die. And any positive um, development that we've seen is going to be undone. And I, I worry about that because on one, I mean, we have Donald Trump is the president. Um, he changes his opinion from one day to the next. Uh, he was threatening to reopen the economy. And then he had a meeting with business leaders yesterday for an hour and he changed his mind and he said that we wouldn't reopen the economy until we had widespread testing available. And then today it seems like he's wavering on his last opinion on, you know, mm -hmm. this whole situation. So we lack leadership in the executive branch. There's no question about that. We lack leadership when it comes to Congress's actions in providing the financial relief that actually um, meets the crisis that we're in right now. And we have endless misinformation campaigns on conservative news sites, conservative cable news outlets, and on social media. Yeah. So I don't see anyone really tackling these issues in a substantive way, and it's terrifying. Yeah, and in, in terms of the misinformation, we're going to have more on that in, in just a bit. Um, I want to go through a couple more of these quotes. Um, Ashley Smith goes on to say, uh, we are not promised a pathogen-free existence. We do not have a constitutional right to not get a virus. Uh, yeah, I guess it's not specifically laid out, but there seems to be some concern about the health and welfare of American citizens in various parts of the Constitution. Um, let's see, we've got uh, Brenda Essman, so that's one of the protesters that was interviewed. We're tired of not being able to buy the things we need, go to the hairdressers, get our hair done. Well, yeah, you know, a few people have to die if you can get your hair done. Um, that may have to happen. Uh, there was one interesting interaction, I thought, though. So there's a reporter for Wood TV 8, Leon Hendricks, who uh, went up to a protester and asked him, are you concerned about this virus? And the protester, uh, Joseph Dixon, responds, I was in the beginning until I've done my research and found out the realities and the media's overreach on it and that it's not as serious as they made it out to be. And that's why I'm here, because I feel that they are overreaching, overreacting and crushing our small businesses, crushing our economy. Uh, then the the reporter had a follow-up question. I see you're wearing a mask, so you must have some level of concern. And he was, by the way, not just wearing a mask. He was wearing a full balaclava, <laughs> which might have been to intimidate people. And he says, look, well, I, you know, I still have common sense. Okay, well, demonstrate it. Because you are willing to put on the mask to protect yourself in the short term, uh, since none of the people these protests were social distancing. They were packed in there. Um, but you're not necessarily concerned about other people being exposed if these measures are uh, are taken away uh, preemptively. And, you know, and there's other people talking about, like, that the the huge number... So one, a rally organizer, uh, Roseanne Punkowski. So she heads up uh, Michigan Conservative Coalition, a pro-Trump group. Um, she said they were predicting huge numbers of people falling ill and dying, and that wasn't the case. Well, look, I'm looking at... Um, New York uh, just added some extra deaths to two days ago. So they they had been previously unreported, but now they've been confirmed. So now the death count for April 14th is listed as 6,185. Yesterday was nearly 2,800. Maybe that's not a lot for some people. I don't know what horror movies they watch every day, but that seems pretty bad to me. I mean, one day, two 9-11s, that seems pretty bad. We have these high numbers given the fact that we're four and a half months into the year and we have been practicing social distancing. So imagine if we hadn't been doing that, how high the numbers would be, right? So a lot of people feel this need to compare the number of deaths to what the country experiences in any given year uh, with deaths caused by the common flu. Mm -hmm. But this virus is not the common flu. And I feel like a broken record because I've been making this argument over and over again. 
For instance, you can be completely asymptomatic and you can spread this virus like wildfire. It's highly contagious. You do not need to show symptoms in order to spread it. And it attacks your respiratory system aggressively. So if you have underlying health conditions, respiratory conditions, if you have diabetes, if you have any issues with your organs, like uh, chronic kidney failure, that kind of stuff, you are very likely to suffer the dire consequences of this virus. And remember, we have this for-profit healthcare model, which means that our hospitals do not have an, enough beds in order to take care of all of these sick patients, right? So remember, like people keep talking about these ventilators and, and oh, the national stockpile. Why do you think the national stockpile needed to have these ventilators, respirators, and all the medical supplies that we need? Because hospitals do not find it profitable to buy this equipment and just store it in their hospitals when most of the time it's not being used. When you have a for-profit healthcare system, it's just not in the best position to take care of a giant number of people or a giant influx of people who become sick in the middle of a pandemic. So the reason why we're social distancing is not only to save lives, that's the number one underlying issue here, but it's also to ensure that our healthcare system and our hospitals are not overwhelmed and overburdened with the number of patients who end up contracting this virus. You know, there are a number of deaths now um, rising that aren't directly caused by uh, COVID-19, it's indirectly caused by COVID-19. So if you're a cancer patient, for instance, um, it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to get the type of medical attention that you would usually get uh, when we're not dealing with a pandemic. So people are dying in their homes right now um, yeah. because of COVID-19, but also because they have other health issues that aren't being taken care of because the hospitals are overwhelmed. These people are not only playing with their own lives, they're playing with the lives of other people who are trying to do things responsibly. And it's yeah. just like, it's devastating to see it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. hundred percent. And and to see these people rallying, and and by the way, the, the rallies are basically Trump rallies. People have the MAGA hats. There's let me, let me show you this this one photo. There's bring guns. Guns have absolutely nothing to do with it, but they're packing, you know, assault rifles. That's necessary. Um, yeah, and it's they trust Trump. I mean, like the reporting from a couple days ago where he kept asking and kept having to get corrected when he said, "Why can't we just let it wash over America?" You know. Yeah. And I... let all these people die with no defense whatsoever. Like, have have you seen like prominent former Trump supporters, maybe in the media or something saying, wait a second, that seems like a bit of a red line to cross consigning hundreds of thousands or millions to die with no protection whatsoever because you think it's easier. But that's gone. That story's gone. I'm literally the only person that's going to mention it today and tomorrow. Not even me. We're all going to move past his theory that we should just let millions die. For more political news, breakdowns, interviews, stories of activism, and me trying my hardest to care about the occasional big celebrity news story, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the damage report. And you can ring the bell wherever it is so you don't miss anything.